So I'm the least equipped to actually answer questions on that, but I, you know, happy to happy to oblige, and we have an expert here. Um, awesome. Well, thanks, Marianne. Thanks everybody, sort of, for um, uh, joining us here. And um, I guess they use the same Slido link, Marianne. Do I need to make any logistics announcements at all? So same Slido link for uh, for people to sort of ask questions. Uh, Nikki and me had a, had a conversation earlier, and we said we want this to be as conversational as possible. So we'll try and take you know a significant number of questions from the audience, and feel free to direct them. Uh, but you know, why don't we start off, Nikki, potentially with you, you know, giving a quick introduction about yourself, and um, we'll kick it off from there. Yeah, sure. So thanks for having me. Um, is this on? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. Um, so I'm an investor with with Draper Esprit. Um, to give you a Kind of a quick overview of Draper Esprit. We're a sort of London-based pan-European uh, venture capital investor. Uh, so we focus on backing early stage and high growth technology companies that have the ambition to be global scale businesses. Uh, our focus is, you know, the, these labels are increasingly irrelevant, but we talk about series A to C. So we don't typically invest at seed directly. Um, but we invest really at that sort of scale-up stage, so average check size for us can range from kind of five, six, seven million on the small end up to about maybe 40 million on, on the large end. Um, we're a technology investor and we define technology very broadly, so everything from consumer companies, we're lucky to be an investor, an early investor in List, so I actually sit on the board of List. Um, uh, we invest in consumer businesses, we invest in B2B software, deep tech and hardware, we're not afraid of semiconductor and, and chip businesses, uh, and digital health is another area. So that really covers everything sort of within, within technology. Um, and really what we care about is backing businesses and entrepreneurs that have the ambition and the opportunity to build global scale companies. Um, we're slightly unusual because we're a publicly quoted venture capital firm. Uh, that really came from a place of believing that the venture model was a little bit broken in Europe. Uh, Chris mentioned how long he's been in the business. He's 10 years. I mean, the reality is scaling a global company is a, is a long time horizon. And so the traditional venture model uh, doesn't necessarily always align with that. So really what we pioneer is patient capital. We invest from our own balance sheet. We invest about 100 to 150 million a year. Um, and that's, that's our focus. Um, my very quick background, I started life as an investment banker in technology um, back in the day, and then I got into venture pretty early uh, when I joined what was Benchmark Europe, now Boulderton. I interviewed Chris when he joined, so sort of small world. Chris and I worked together at Boulderton, so I, had my, I did five years of venture investing. I also left and started a fashion e-commerce company in 2010. Uh, built in that, sold it in 2015, less fanfare and success than Chris. And then I came back to venture capital in, uh, in about uh, three years ago. Um, so now back, having, having had the experience of being on the entrepreneur side, back, back on the investment side. Awesome, amazing. Uh, I'll just take a few moments to quickly introduce myself and then we'll mm. jump right in. Um, hi guys, I'm Bhavin Tarakhya. Uh, I've been a serial entrepreneur, as sort of Marian pointed out, and uh, a good friend of his. Uh, I have, uh, I started coding when I was 10 years old, so I was fortunate to find my passion really early on in life. Um, started my first company when I was 17, um, exited that after running it for about 14, 15 years, um, close to $160 million transaction with a public company based in Boston uh, called Endurance. Uh, since then, I've, I've been part of founding four different companies, had one other exit, um, currently one three. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody else, um, but... Um, uh, one of them is called Radix. It's a top-level domain registry, so we own .store, .tag, .online, and various sort of top-level extensions. Uh, another one is called Flock, which is basically a competitor to Slack and Microsoft Teams, so we have an enterprise messenger. Um, and the third one, which is the only one that I've actually historically raised any capital for, is, is called Zeta. Uh, and uh, Zeta is a digital payments, um, so we provide um, software for enterprise payments and banking software and, and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, that's a sort of a quick introduction. Uh, it's kind of an interesting contrast here with, uh, with, uh, with uh, you know, you being sort of on the funding side. And, and for me, as I said, I have very little experience in that, in that respect. Uh, you mentioned that you sort of focus uh, earlier in our call on, on 
B2B and B2C uh, investments both. Mm -hmm. um, so we'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of the differences between the two in terms of, from your perspective as an investor, what you look for, um, and uh, you know, they're pretty diverse. I mean, I've been a B2B SaaS guy all my life, mm -hmm. so uh, that's a space I'm much more familiar with, but we'd love to hear your thoughts on kind of the differences between the two, the way you see them. Yeah. I mean, fundamentally, what you're looking for as an investor is a large-scale market opportunity. That can very much exist in the consumer space, or, or it might exist in the enterprise space, uh, or, or the SME space. Um, so, so we're very comfortable and happy and have experience in investing across, across all of those. I personally do both B2B and B2C as well. Um, it's about, what, I mean, what are you looking for? I mean, number one, and this is common, what are the common things you're looking for regardless of the space? I come back to, is there a very large market opportunity here? Are you solving a, a very specific problem in that market opportunity? Is there somebody that will pay for that? Um, and, you know, we always use the, are you solving a problem? Sometimes it can be in the consumer space. It might simply be a, a problem. It might just simply be, for example, a form of entertainment. I mean, all of that is, is sort of true. So in the enterprise tends to be more problem solving focused. That's certainly also true in consumer, but there's more opportunity to build a product that sort of, you know, sparks I was going to about to say sparks joy, sparks delight, uh, as well as as well as solves a problem. But I mean, the common recurring themes have got to be around the scale of the market opportunity. There is demand for either you're filling a gap in terms of either an entertainment or a product. There is a sort of a you can think about a product that will fit that. There's a business model that you can wrap around that, and people want to use it. Um, they're your sort of fundamentals. I mean, you come into you come onto the consumer side, it tends to be much more of a sort of a volume game. It's mass market. Is this, you know, can we get millions and millions of people using this? And then if you're looking at a consumer opportunity, you're really thinking about, okay, well, I've got to sell this product or sell this experience to millions of people. How am I going to reach millions of people? How am I going to do that? When you're in the B2B side, it's different. You're selling to enterprise customers. The sales cycle looks a little bit more defined. So how are you going to reach a business and how are you going to solve for that? So, you know, it's, it's different questions. But, I mean, the, the fundamental similarity is big problem. Are you solving it? Uh, makes sense. I mean, it's interesting because when we think about evaluating business opportunities for us hmm. uh, as a company, we kind of you touched all the points, but we look at target persona, Hmm. The problem that you're solving and is your solution actually 10x better than hmm. existing exactly. solutions? Yeah. Go to market strategy, which is kind of what you mm -hmm. said. I think there's a difference between B2C and B2B. Um, revenue model. And then one thing that I think a lot of people sometimes tend to miss out on is, is do you have a moat? Mm -hmm. you know, do you, if you're going to set up this business, can somebody else come and just replicate everything that you're doing? And, and, yeah. uh, and so do you really have a moat that can protect yeah, whether defensible. it's an IP moat? Or, yeah. um, so it's interesting, kind of similar evaluation criteria. Let's, uh, let's uh, um, uh, you know... Uh, Talk a little bit about, you said you, you actually spent some time in the startup world yourself. Mm -hmm. um, um, what, you know, give us a bit of a background of the company. What, what did it do? You know, um, what, what you know, got you decided to sort of change back into kind of the VC world? Mm. We'd love to hear a bit more about that. Sure. Well, I mean, you know, not dissimilar to Chris. I mean, when you're in a venture capital firm, you're in a pretty interesting position to see a lot of what's happening and you're surrounded by a lot of entrepreneurs. And I would never have called myself an entrepreneur. I mean, kind of unlike Chris, who was sort of setting out to build things and start his own company, I absolutely wasn't. Um, I was an investment banker. I was a, I was a VC investor. Um, but I think y you surround yourself by people. You just absorb an awful lot. And at the time, you know, this was you know, 2006, 7, 8, 9, there's the emergence of early Airbnb, peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, peer-to-peer -peer house rental, a lot of that was going on. The the e-commerce ecosystem was exploding. The secondary marketplace uh, ecosystem was exploding. And so it was sort of not such a light bulb moment, but a connect the dots moment where I... What we had seen was eBay had been the dominant platform in marketplaces, but there were verticals now that were kind of emerging from eBay and being their own standalone verticals. Car marketplaces, for example, so coming away from eBay and dedicated car marketplaces. Accommodation happening, the same thing. Um, and for me, actually, uh, I had worked closely with businesses like Ukes and the, the Bolton portfolio. I, I thought, 
actually fashion, the kind of buying and selling experience on eBay is really poor. So I set up a marketplace in order to sort of solve for that, which was to offer a hassle-free way of selling and, and you know, selling on pre-owned, second-hand designer clothing. We were really hawking a sustainability message, and I was probably about eight years <laughs> too early. Um, and there was lots of things that we kind of could have done uh, differently along the way. But when I set up that business, which was a marketplace for pre-owned luxury fashion, where I raised money from a strategic investor, which was ASOS, and they joined my board, built it over five years, and ultimately ASOS bought the company in 2015. Um, would you do it again? Is there, are there plans of <laughs> jumping back into the entrepreneur? No plans afoot. I genuinely think I'm better at this side of the table as an investor than I was at that side of the table. And my propensity for that level of risk right now, I mean, Chris talked about those early days. I mean, it's no joke. It, it really is. It's a, it's a lonely place to be as an entrepreneur. It's incredibly hard work. Um, and it's, but it's also an amazing place to be. It's, you know, working for yourself like a, the way I say it, the highs are higher and the lows are lower when you're doing everything yourself. Like, no question. Just so, um, so look, I would never rule it out. I don't have any intention to, to set up a company in the, in the near term. I'm kind of happy doing what I'm doing, but never say never. Um, so what are some of the, you know, going back again to sort of those times, what are some of the interesting lessons that you learned as an entrepreneur? Um, and then how do you apply them now, kind of sitting again on the opposite side of the table when you're looking at sort of, entrepreneurs invest in? So, I mean, look, a lot of school of thought does having been an entrepreneur make you a better investor. Some investors will say yes, some will say no. And I, I don't have the answer to that. Does it make me maybe understand the types of businesses I was in better? Yeah, sure, I ran that business. What it really does do, though, is, like, I've had to hire and fire people. I've, I've had to be the one to... I'm, I've fundraised now on both sides of the table, and we can, we can talk about sort of fundraising, but... I know what it's like. I, for five years, I was the one who could say yes or no, you know, and then I suddenly was the one saying, you know, please back me. And that kind of puts you in a different place. So just it really is a much deeper level of uh, understanding and appreciation for quite the level of sacrifice that entrepreneurs are going through. It is a, it's a huge sacrifice. Um, it's a very personal journey as well, and you can't get away from that. Um, so for me, kind of being back investing now, I just feel like I have a good sense if, if an investor has to, or if a, an entrepreneur or one of the entrepreneurs that I said has a really, really difficult decision to make, I sort of feel like I've, you know, not necessarily faced every challenge they have faced by any stretch, but I have a level of understanding of the, of the, the path that they're going down and the challenges that they're facing, because I probably face some of them as well. And so, you know, could you elaborate on, I don't know, sort of any mistakes that you made during that journey that you learned from or um, any general sort of thoughts and advice around that time? Uh, I was kind of nodding away when Chris talked about starting with things that sort of don't scale, right? Get out there. I'm a big fan of get a product out there, get people using it. And somebody uh, once said to me, if you're not embarrassed about the first product that you shipped, then you shipped too late, right? So you will never learn as much about your product or what you're trying to do until you have it in the hands of a user. Um, so, so for us, we very much sort of took that approach. Uh, and a lot of what we were doing, because we physically held stock, and uh, the proposition was kind of hassle-free selling, and we acted like a retailer, but it was a marketplace. We didn't buy stock, but we held it. We authenticated. We fully quality controlled. We, uh, we shipped in 24 hours. We professionally photographed everything. It's a lot of heavy lifting. So it was very manual, and, and we knew that a lot of what we could do, we could automate a lot of what we were doing, but we needed to kind of get going with it. Um, and I would say we, were, we went too far down that route, and ultimately that became the issue we had with fundraising, was scalability, right? You're doing an awful lot manual you know, to, to grow your volume, you're just adding people, and that was true, and even though we could see a path to how we could scale it, you know, fundamentally, I think we went too far down the route of doing things in a non-scalable way that VCs sort of struggled to see that path. Yeah, I mean, I think both extremes actually have their, and I've seen, I've been on both sides yeah. in some sense. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I love that advice, by the way. I mean, I'll say the same thing myself. I think some of the biggest mistakes that I've made in my life have been around product management. Mm. Um, I've had an idea or a hypothesis and built a ton of stuff before putting it out there, assuming that the whole world's gonna want it only to subsequently discover nobody does. 
And, uh, uh, and really, that, that one advice, I mean, now we sort of try and get stuff not just product as early as possible in the hands yeah. of consumers, yeah. but like wireframes and prototypes. But there's prototypes nothing sadder and... than the day, especially when you're a retailer, that you put your website live and you just think the minute you turn it on, the sales <laughs> yeah, will roll in. It, they'll come. I'll never it's... forget that first day we went live and myself and my co-founder just sat there. <laughs> Who's going to buy? Why is the phone an moving? hour later, we were like, shall we make a cup of tea? Nobody's bought. And then my very first king of a sale. And I was like, our first sale. We no, it's, it's... It went into the back end. It was my mother-in-law. I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have our first like non-charity, non-family sale. Um, but I mean, that's the point. You kind of, the, the things you think about, I was like, I'll go live with, if I put it on the, on the interweb, everybody's going to come and use it. Uh, and it's just really thinking through, right? Okay, that's fine. We've got a basic product. But I mean, if you are not thinking through, how are we acquiring our customers? How are we converting our customers? But you have to go through those learnings. Right? No, absolutely. That's, I mean, you, you, that's the painful first few years. It is. It is. And I mean, I would say right from conceptualization, building the product, you know, the entire discovery phase. The sooner you're out there talking to customers, uh, I, I think you know. In Chris's talk, there was a question here uh, that I saw that said, "If I had two thousand pounds, you know, what would I start with?" And my answer would be, "Build your first prototypes and go and talk to as many customers as you can." Mm -hmm. um, that's really what you start with um, at all points in time. Validate the idea as fast as possible. Yeah. Uh, but that's amazing. Thanks. That's uh, brilliant advice. Let's switch gears into, I guess, in some sense, what people are, are here to sort of hear from you uh, about, which is, you know, funding. Um, um, well, I would say, actually, um, before we get to sort of what you look for in, you know, potential companies, um, an interesting sort of uh, question will be, like, what should, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people out here that are, that are either in sort of different stages looking for funding or may, may look to do that sort of in the future. What should they look for in terms of raising funds um, from an investor, mm -hmm. um, what are the attributes they, that they should expect? So the first question I think people should be asking is, should I raise funds? Um, and I don't think enough people ask themselves that question. I think there's just this automatic assumption of set up a business, therefore I put myself on the venture capital track and I'm going to go and raise VC money. Um, in the broader scheme of, you know, our economy and, and businesses, only a very, very small percentage of businesses are actually suitable for venture capital funding. Um, and so I think you really need to have a think about like what that means. And so what do I what do I mean by that? So okay, we talk about, I mean ultimately venture capital as an asset class is is a is a funding model designed to deliver very high returns for very high risk. That means the very high returns piece has to be achievable. Um, and what does that mean? That means that the scale of the business opportunity has to be very significant and the capital requirements then in line with that and the ability to ultimately IPO a business or potentially sell a business for a very large, say, multiple of revenue has to be, has to be there. You know, venture capital is not suitable, and, and a lot of people will already know this, but if it's a services business, if it's a very people-heavy business that, you know, we talked about scalability. Fundamentally, VCs back scalable companies, so the ability to go from zero to 10 and 10 to 100 pretty rapidly. Um, and I think, you know, so that's, that's the first point, which is, is the actual business and business model itself suitable for venture capital funding? The second thing is, as an entrepreneur, is that a choice you want to make uh, to go down the venture capital route? And the way I, the way I position it is, um, now you'll start at sort of maybe raising pre-seed and seed, but as soon as you're on that fundraising train, you're kind of on it. And the day you raise 10 million from a VC like us is the day you take 100 million exit off the table. Because that's not a sort of successful outcome for us. And if you don't go and raise all that money and you still own 80, 90% of your business and you sell that business for 50, 60, 70 million, that's an enormous and successful and game-changing outcome in anybody's book. Not if you've kind of gotten yourself to a point that like you've diluted down, you've taken on external funding. And the reason you will choose to do that is because you are comfortable as an entrepreneur owning a smaller piece of something that could be much bigger. So it is a decision to say, I prefer to ultimately own, I'm going to throw out numbers, but you know, 20, 25, 
of a billion dollar business that I'm gonna, I believe there's an opportunity to build here and I'm going to need capital and help to help me get there and that's the path I'm going to choose because that's my ambition for this company. That's very fair, that's, that's the route you go down. Alter an, a, an equally viable alternative is, yeah, there's a big market, but you know what, I don't want to keep my options open. Maybe I want to sell this business for 50 million in a few years' time and still be an 80% owner of that business and not have VCs on my board. Um, and, and that you might then choose a different path, and, and maybe it's just raising kind of smaller amounts of money, or maybe it's just taking different, or it's bootstrapping it and keeping your options open. So, you know, I think the first question to ask that not enough people really think about is what does it mean to take on VC money, and can you stand up and say that I am choosing the path of long term, I will be the uh, you know, 20, 25% owner of a billion dollar business, and, and I'm going to use VC to help me get this business there. And then if you do go down that path, that's what we're here for. Um, and, uh, but I find I have that conversation with entrepreneurs a lot now, which is really understanding the personal motivations behind raising capital uh, and what they want for their business uh, in the long term. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I will say this. I mean, as somebody who's actually bootstrapped all his life and then now kind of recently raised, uh, mm. raised around for my company, um, that you know you, you want to raise for a purpose and you need to be mm. clear about what that goal is yeah. you know uh, depending on the stage of the company depending on what you're trying to achieve uh, don't just raise money for the sake of raising money um, yeah. unless somebody's throwing a arbitrarily large valuation at you for uh, uh, for no reason at all but uh, but otherwise yeah raise for a specific purpose um, I guess we have uh, some time left so I'm gonna actually jump onto the audience questions um, and the first one from Sean is uh, should you raise capital unless you have found product market fit uh, in your definition, what is it? Uh, I guess that's for PMF. And raise little or a lot, and why, in your opinion? This is like three questions. Uh, <laughs> sneaky. Um, uh, raising capital of product market fit, that's about the right fund at your stage. Uh, we happen to be a sort of Series A, B fund, so we don't tend to kind of operate at that, call it pre-product market fit. And that's a little bit of an arbitrary definition. I mean, this is how people define product market fit it can vary. Um, typically, and I use the word typically because, of course, you know, there's always going to be exceptions, um, seed funding or institutional seed funding and seed stage is really designed to be raised exactly that, pre-product market fit. So product market fit is about getting to a point that you understand that customers are using, are fully engaging, and effectively are pulling your product. It's not an uphill battle to get the product into the hands of people. And once it's in people's hands, you can measure and look at engagement and repeatability. Right. So for me, I look at product market fit as whatever metric shows repeatability, so that the customers who are using it are sticking. Uh, or even better, our customers are starting to come to you as well to kind of pull the product. So, Seed funding is typically used, so, so should you raise capital, if, if you want to raise seed funding and you need to kind of time to build a product and hire a couple of people, absolutely. I mean, most seed funds would describe their investments as really just core backing a team to build a product. Once you kind of get to Series A, Series B, and you're talking about raising five million plus, that's when we start looking more at what's actually happening under the hood at the product and customer level. But you know, should you you might absolutely choose to raise seed capital, or you may not, and you can bootstrap it as long as you want, and there'll be trade-offs there. But you can raise capital <coughs> pre-product market fit is, is probably the point. Um, and I, I mean I can just give sort of a quick uh, uh, objective mathematical definition that we use for product market fit in general, which is when you have a asymptotic retention graph, you are at product market fit, which means for every 100 customers that you get in the door, if all 100 are leaving, you don't have product market fit. If some will leave eventually, but out of 100, if 40 are sticking with you, willing to pay for your product, continuing to use you, so your kind of retention graph kind of drops and then flattens out to the x-axis, the moment you see that graph, that's kind of the first sign that you're getting close to where you have product market fit, and that's how we kind of uh, evaluate PMF for our, um, for our products. Um, Russ is asking, how do you suggest raising funds before? Well, this is kind of similar to um, the previous question. That's, it's about targeting the right funds. I mean, don't pick up the phone to a largely Series B investor if you're a seed stage company. And 
you know, you'd still, I, it still amazes me how many people actually do that. It's really, I, I, it's quite easy now, and I, I come from a place where I started a venture in the UK in 2006, and like the market has come on in so much in terms of information and quality of information that's available. So to me, not to sound harsh, but there's no excuse for not having been able to do the research if you're in London in particular, and I appreciate it can be harder if you're, you're not in a hub like London, but you know, there is no shortage of lists of active seed funds and, and who does what, who focuses on what stage, and most VC websites will talk about what they look for in terms of stage and sweet spot, and you can see in their portfolio and their news the kinds of deals that they're doing. So figure out who looks like they invest in your stage and invest there, and then kind of target your approach to them. Awesome, and I think that's all the time we have, so thank you yep. so much, uh, Nikki, and thanks everybody. Yep.